Okay, we're recording. Please go ahead. Okay, uh, welcome everyone. This is the meeting of the Finance Committee. Um, I'm calling it to order at 4.03 p.m. We do have a quorum, although we're missing a couple of our, our members. Um, this uh, meeting is being held remotely, so um, pursuant to a, a variety of, of, of actions by the legislature. Um, and so uh, all comment, will public comment will be via Zoom um, or via telephone uh, if you are on on a phone line, you can um, you can raise your hand by I think it's star nine, um, and then we can we can identify we can uh, bring you in for public comment. I apologize for the confusion on the start time of this meeting, but um, we it was because of a um, the holiday on Monday. We I was not able to get it um, set up in time, so we had to push it back to four o'clock in order to give 48 hours notice as required. So um, I do apologize for that, but hopefully that means more people will be able to, to join in and listen. Um, I, let's uh, go around, I see Kathy has joined us. Let's go around the room to see whether uh, you could be, I can hear you and you can hear me. Uh, Matt? Here, Bob. Councilor Haneke. Present. Andy. Present. Uh, Kathy. I'm here. All right, uh, Doug, we can hear you. Uh, I see Holly's here. Can we hear you? You're on. You're, you're on mute, Holly. <laughs> yes, I am here. Um, and I just wanted to apologize to everybody um, because of the change in times. I did not communicate that to our auditors, and they had another um uh commitment that they were not going to be able to make today so we are rescheduling the auditors for i believe it is the may 7th meeting okay no problem let's put that in there pardon me bob i'm noticing that councilor lord is in the audience this meeting isn't posted as a joint meeting of the council and finance committee i just wanted to let you know um the meeting Next week on the 25th, the public forum on the regional school budget is posted as a finance committee and town council meeting. So counselors will be joining that meeting. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I think Kathy, you... Kathy, my my um, connection is spotty, so I'm going to make you a co-host so you can help with um, public comment if you don't mind allowing people to talk. That's fine. Thanks. Thank you, Kathy. So we have, um, uh, Kathy, did you want to say Yeah, something? I just have a quick question. I guess it's of Holly. Um, in reading through the documents for the audit on the main document, which is the financial accounting, I, had a, I have a couple of questions just on terms, which is a little embarrassing because it may be the fifth or six, fifth year I've looked at these or sixth year, but can I just send them to you, Holly? You know, it's purely like, what's the definition of this and where does the number come from? So it's not on the auditor's report. Uh, I mean, I sure. can see, I can go through you, Bob, if you want to, because others may have them. Okay, thanks. Fine. Holly, if you could just um, respond to, to Kathy and myself, and then I'll, I'll just send it around to the committee so everyone has this, the same information. Yep, that's fine, absolutely. Great, thank you. Okay, so I think um, we, we, I'm trying to think, uh, we have seven attendees, um, but I think, uh, well, Doug, can I ask you, do, is Mary Best going to be able to join us? Do you know? I really don't. I'm not sure. I think she might be traveling, so I don't think she's going to okay. be able okay. to. So um, I think uh, for those, uh, we, our, our agenda is kind of blown up, <laughs> um, but I think we should launch right into the review of the, the school budget um, to give Doug a chance to... Uh, you know, have a say and then move on to other things. And then um, we'll have public comment after that. Uh, if So Doug, um, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Uh, we sent you a bunch of questions and uh, Matt, did you wanna excuse yourself? 
recuse yourself? Yeah, Bob, I'm going to go ahead and recuse right now. And Athena, thank you for moving me into the audience. Okay. Okay, so Doug, uh, you know, can you just give us, uh, you know, your responses? And uh, I mean, I know we asked a lot of different questions, so maybe you can kind of give us a, you know, you don't have to answer everyone verbatim, but uh, if you can give us a kind of a overall uh, view of, of the budget yeah, as it evolved, so. So let me ask this question. I'm, I'm not sure I've gotten those questions. So when oh. were they sent? Uh, and from whom? Uh, they, they came from Bob. I, I, I sent them from to Athena and to Lynn, but I did not send them to you. Um, okay, oh. so, well, uh, maybe I should just go through what we have. Um, I, I know you won't be able to answer some of these right away, uh, but we do have time. So maybe um, if we can get them to you, um, we can, um, you know, you can, you can fill in some of the blanks. Um, Sure. One of the things, the first thing we wanted to know was, you know, kind of over time, the staffing and enrollment trends. So, um, and we we wanted every like five years, so it's not, you know, super burdensome, but the idea is to look at how many FTE staff we have, how's that broken out between regular and special needs, um, how many students, how many students with disabilities, so to just to see the patterns over time or the trends over time, um, and I obviously you maybe you can give us a, a verbal summary, but obviously you obviously can't give us the precise numbers right now. Yeah, I can give you a brief brief overview. I mean, in general, our, our enrollments are, are down over the last several years, um, and so the the tricky thing is that our our um, you know when when you scale that way, you know, the students sort of leave in, in small numbers over time, but the sort of changes in staffing tend to be a little more stepwise because, uh, you know, sort of reduces section requires a certain number of students at that grade level kind of grouping to cause that to happen. So, so while I think they track pretty closely, I mean, you know, over time we've reduced staff in some areas in, in, in corresponding uh, fashion to the student enrollment. Um, you know, it's, it's probably not entirely kept exactly the same pace as the student enrollment. I think as far as, you know, when you look at our number of students in, in special education, our percentage has gone up. What's really happened there is, is, and this is true in a number of our categories of students, depending on what you want to pick, you know, uh, uh, English learners, et cetera, et cetera, is that generally speaking, we've held fairly steady in the numbers of students in those categories and the totality of students has gone down. So the percentage has gone up. Um, so we see a slight increase in, in the percentage uh, or not so slight increase in the percentage sometimes, but you see an increase in the percentage of students, um, but the total number of students has stayed not too different. It's the to it's the overall student count that, that's gone down. So, um, and I think the other thing, just special education specifically, is I think some things are presenting differently than they have in past. And so we're seeing an uptick relative to need for students uh, more in the mental health and social emotional sort of categories. Um, that's a very, very broad, you know, statement. I wouldn't, you know, do I have the, that's anecdotal as well. I wouldn't suggest that I've crunched the numbers on that, but that's the, that's the, uh, the indication there in, in some respects on, on that. Um, but I think in a broad sense, I did a quick look earlier in like number of administrators we had, I don't know, 20 years ago versus now, or people in the sort of central office versus this change in enrollment. I mean, I just did it back the envelope and, and we've scaled kind of similarly. You know, in other words, we've lost X number of student or percentage of students. We've lost a similar number of central office staff. So we've kind of scaled certainly centrally in a, in a fairly parallel way to, to the students. Uh, my expectation would be that just by necessity, we've had to do the same thing with staffing, uh, teaching and other staff as well. If anybody has any questions, please raise your hand, you know, as, as, as Doug goes along. Uh, Councilor Haneke? Yeah, I know you don't have the numbers and it's going to be really important for us to get some numbers, um, you know, by the 25th when we have a hearing. I'm not sure if we don't have written answers to some of these questions, we're going to be able to make a recommendation at that hearing on the 25th. Um, but you, you talk about the numbers of special 
ed students um, staying approximately consistent, even if the percentage looks different because of the decrease in total enrollment. Um, what do you know of the numbers of educators um, for special education, whether it be uh, certified teachers or paraeducators over that same amount of time? Has that number stayed fairly steady? Um, or has that number increased or decreased? You know, where, where does that relate compared to, you know, a steady number of enrolled students or fairly steady enrolled students in special needs? Let me see if I can answer that in a more concrete way. Um, see how quickly I can get to perhaps an answer in that regard, broadly speaking. Um, my guess would be as far as, and I'll, I'll look up the actual numbers here a little bit more closely. Um, you know, our, our, uh, our trends in, you know, looking at special education instruction, so this would be teachers at the middle school and high school uh, have trended upward a little bit, but it's been steady over the last 22, 23, 24, last three years. Um, you know, you look at, let me see if I can find the sort of paraeducator section, because that's where the big numbers are is with our teachers and our paras. Um, um, yeah, those have trended up to some extent. Um, you know, I can get you better numbers, uh, you know, before your meeting on the, on the, on the, uh, 25th. Um, so that is a Thursday meeting just to make sure I got the date, right? 25th. Yes. Is that right? That's um, correct. yeah. So some of those have trended up. And so some of that's dependent upon, you know, the specifics of particular kids, uh, needs. Um, so that makes a difference as to how, you know, whether or not kids need a paraeducator or don't need a paraeducator as part of their IEP. You know, those just to inform you broadly or the, the group broadly about, you know, the IEP process, individualized education plan, it's a contract between the, the district and the parents and the families about what's the best way and the most least or the least restrictive way to provide uh, educational services to those students. But it is, uh, you know, binding. So once that agreement is signed, that is what we are compelled to provide. Um, in order to meet the, the requirements of that and to educate that student. And so if our students profiles have changed, uh, then we have to meet those needs, whatever those happen to be. So that's that's a factor that's sort of, you know, not purely financial sometimes. Uh, and, and it varies from year to year, you know, with with regard to who the kids are and what their their needs are. I mean, obviously, what we'd like to do with a lot of kids is if if we can uh, have them mature in a way as they get through and, and proceed through high school to you know mature out of some of that level of need, that'd be great. Not everybody does. Um, and and I think that that uh, you know the kinds of things that we're we're seeing with regard to the pandemic and results of that are 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 showing up in in some of our our uh, snapping levels for sure. Okay. Um, again, I don't know that you can answer this now, but we we did like to also see a comparison between Amherst and other towns with a similar size, seven to twelve enrollments in terms of overall costs and um you know mix of regular and special needs again it may not you may not have all that information but um anything you can do to kind of like anchor what we're doing versus what other other towns are doing in terms of um the costs and you know the, the um what you know, I, can, I can tell you this. i can tell you from a staffing standpoint we have we have more staff than most other towns um, you know, they're sort of similar in size. Do we have, you know, wildly different profiles? I don't, I don't know that we necessarily do or don't. Um, but, but we do have more staff in particular paraeducators. We have a much higher number than most other, other districts do. I think how we approach that is a little different. Some of it depends on, there's some of it's driven by the programming that we offer, which kind of skews things a little bit sometimes. Uh, in other words, there, there are, um, for example, we offer some in-district programs of a higher level of need, which have higher level of staffing. And we also have a lot fewer out of district placements than a lot of districts our size. So there's a sort of give and take between those two dynamics because 
you know, when we send kids out, um, and we've had an uptick in that this year, and it's it's a disconcerting one for us um, because we like to be able to to have those kids be in our district. But that's part of the trade-off too when we start to compare with other districts: is do they offer programming like we do uh, that allows kids to remain within within the district, um, and also bolsters our our in-house costs and in-house personnel counts. So we've got to kind of weigh those those against each other. So we take a holistic view to the, to that. But I can. Uh, I'll get you some, some more specifics, but certainly we have more parents than other people do, and I think we have more programming than other people do, um, and less out of district placements than other people do. Uh, Councilor Hannigan, thank you. That 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 comment just brought up a question in my mind. We talk a lot about per student costs and how that relates to the amount of money that is paid in charter tuition out of our district to other charters um, because it's based on per student costs of our district. And how does that per student cost if you, I'm just trying to figure out relationships here, um, not advocating something one way or another. I just have to ask that, state that before I ask this question. Um, how does that relate to the charter per student cost formula for sending a student out of district versus providing all of those services in district. Does providing them in district go into our per student cost for charter school tuition costs? And does out of district placements go into the per student costs or are they calculated separately? I'm gonna give you an unsatisfactory answer here. <clears throat> uh, yes and no. So some of the costs are included and some of them are not included. Um, and so it, it gets it gets kind of messy relative to sort of teasing that out. Um, um, and I'll, I'll look into the specifics and see if I can you know offer it a, a more constructive way for you guys in, in getting prepared for the budget. But but there are aspects and this is one of the concerns I have about that charter for funding formula is, you know, the nature and severity of of kids and their needs is different in a general public school versus a charter school. Charter school is still considered a public school, but you know, when you have certain areas of focus, that sort of thing, it, it by default precludes certain students from pursuing that as an option. Um, and so the kinds of uh, level of need that they're dealing with is different. Um, and yet I'm not sure all of that, some of that's taken into account in the formulas, but not all of it. Can I follow up? Yeah. Does the formula for that charter school tuition include the out of district tuition placements? Or are those uh, yeah. excluded from the formula? I'm not sure exactly because there's multiple pieces to an out of district placement. There's the actual placement itself, there's the transportation cost, there's, you know, is there support for the student on the transportation? You know, those different sort of component pieces. And I, I just, I'm not sure off the top of my head which, which are, which aren't, uh, and to what extent. Okay, thank you. Okay, so. Uh, Next set of questions really are ways of maybe alternatively addressing the, the FY25 budget. Um, the first question here is, uh, you know, if we were able to do a one-time gift, say of $300,000, um, what would the, you know, what's teaching staff for other positions would be the top priority for that? That's a great question. Um, I think that it, it probably depends on who you ask, but I, I think the in the in the nitty gritty of that sort of in between, you know, sort of what was talked about in in February and what was talked about in in uh, and voted on by the school committee in March. Um, you know, we haven't had that conversation about what about in between there. Um, I think that the, that you know, in general, you know. Uh, one of the, the lenses that the, the school committee took when they were taking this was to try to, you know, any sort of student facing positions are the ones that they wanted to restore. Um, obviously, those that have the greatest impact um, uh, and have the, the you know, greatest impact in a number of ways, primarily on students, but also staff, because, you know, we're going to use things like um, retirements and exits and that sort of thing to help mitigate the personal impact on individual personnel. Um, and I think that it, it goes to, you know, you have sort of core teaching things that you have to do. So special education requirements of, of, like I said earlier, of the IP, that's going to certainly be areas where we're going to try to bolster those a little bit. We're going to look at our, our most impactful areas of core 
uh, academics. Um, and then, you know, electives would be sort of the third tier. That's the a broad sketch of it. I'd have to have the conversations with I haven't had yet with the with the uh, administration to talk about what's their practical approach. And it some of it depends on on um, uh, course enrollments and sort of where the needs are from a standpoint of, of what kids have, have chosen. So, you know, um, if they were expecting to cut, I'm going to make something up here woodworking, which we, you know, and then suddenly 25 kids shine up for woodworking, we need a section of woodworking, you know, that kind of thing changes what the conversation was a month ago or two months ago. So those also play into the choices that we'll make as, as a district moving ahead. But I, I think, you know, if you think about sort of the triage of, of trying to keep it away from students as much as we can, and, you know, those things that have the highest level of impact, which would be, you know, and, and, uh, and requirements associated with them, like special education, or core subjects that have to be taught to every student, uh, and then electives. That's going to be the broad sort of you know, lens that we take to that. Bob, um, can I follow up on that yeah. one? Yeah. Sure. No, Doug, I apologize. These didn't come to you earlier, especially this one, because this is, uh, I think it requires, you know, what you just did, you know, trying to mull it over. So the notion is whether it's 200 to 300,000, and it's just, let's just for the time being say it's just Amherst giving you the money. Right. And trying to get a sense of if you went back to the drawing board with staff, what would be, where would you most likely put that money compared to what you've shown with the, with the cuts? So rather than trying to give us an answer now, it was trying to say, um, the ask of Amherst was 700,000, but something considerably less. And the other thing I want to say is that if this were just literally one time, you know, so this just uh, uh, takes you through to next year and then you're back where you are, <laughs> you know, just trying to think through uh, what, what, what would be the priorities internally, knowing that it would be student facing, but you know, program areas or anything, it would be helpful for us to know. And I'm not, I, I crafted this question, but I'm not, I'm not convinced we've got $200,000, but it's a sense of something less than the ask, uh, what, what would it buy? It's a pretty crass way of stating that. Thanks. Yeah, I, I appreciate the ask, and, and and it is a legitimate sort of thing. I was, you know, we're we're trying to put together some some materials for for Saturday's meeting, and thinking about exactly that sort of thing is like, is there some in between we can have a conversation about? What does that mean? And and I think it, you know, the the answer not to be too glib is that it depends. Um, if it's sustained support, that's a very different conversation than if it's one time support, um, because if we, you know, generally speaking, given what we've what we've put back in with with the budget that the school committee voted um, are things that if if not continued to be supported. So if it's one time, you know, it, they just get reduced the following year, potentially. Um, if it's ongoing support, then it's then it's a little different sort of strategic conversation about how uh, some of those things play out over time. Um, and like I said, I, you know, I'll, I'll put together some answers with, with staff about that a little bit and, and they're thinking on those, on those fronts. And, and again, there's a piece of it though, that also depends on, on, uh, well, there's some, there's some strategies for the district as far as how do we compete in a, in a market? Cause that's what we do as a school with, you know, charter and choice options out there. Um, so what are things that, that retain students within our building? What evidence do we have that those have worked, those strategies? And then you also have, um, you know, what are programs that we've been uh, trying to encourage and develop and what do we think kids are going to want to take? Because um, you want to sort of meet the kids where they where they want to be as far as those, those uh, course offerings and programs that they have. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> these next questions are, are I'm going to combine two that, that they really get at the specifics that you proposed, I mean, it's kind of complicated because you have the levels, you have the level uh, services budget, then you have the original budget that was voted, and then you have the, the increased budget, um, <laughs> which was, uh, you know, which has been approved or voted by the, uh, the, the school committee. Um, but you, you basically had some, you know, there was a focus on world languages in these, the sort of the final budget uh, or 
you you originally proposed that cut, and then you you that was re restored in the final budget. So, and, and then there were some uh, other counseling and and some other positions. Um, so so first of all, um, how many of these were ESSER supported positions versus um, you know just just other positions? Uh, number two. Um, why these particular cuts rather than other, you know, other cuts. Um, and then sort of associated with that is, I know that there was a lot of concern among uh, the parents at the, at the town council meeting uh, about the loss of AP classes, you know, in languages, you know, further on downstream when the, they're, the students are middle school students are juniors and seniors. Um, but what about working with Amherst College and UMass to get more uh, availability of uh, college level language courses, which could be, you know, my, my son took a, 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 a mathematic, a maths class at UMass and got college credit for it. So it, it, it could be quite beneficial for the students. So I just wanted to kind of put, just, if you can just kind of give us some idea of the rationale behind the specific cuts that were that were proposed. Yeah, so, <clears throat> so just to the ESSER question first, you know, the way we supported the budget this year was a general uh, support of ESSER. So it sort of pushes into an, a variety of areas, mostly in our expense budget. Um, and not really staffing positions. Uh, so we really don't have any staff that are explicitly, you know, there may be some that ultimately get funded that way, but but we didn't explicit, explicitly fund staff with, with ESSER funds. Um, it was more general budget support, mostly on the expense side, but not exclusively. Uh, we'll sort of see how that plays out over the course of the current year and even into the new year to some extent. Um, you know, uh, to the question of sort of why some of these, I think some of it has to do with, um, so some of it was was at the high school, they had a, some, some reorganization of departments. So really reducing the number of departments and it changes the amount of time released for department head work. It makes it harder to get that work done, but it is an economy that, that, that uh, uh, reduces the amount of teaching staff because there's less time released to do department head. And so there's, there's, um, you know, some loss in, in that, you know, administration, coordination, um, curriculum support, et cetera, that department heads do as a result of that, but it, but it preserves sections of, of classes for kids. Um, that's one piece of what was in there. And then, and I think then uh, the, other, the other piece is relative to sort of schedule and, and how our schedule fits uh, and how it's framed and and uh, you know, sort of how many kids are sitting in some of the sections we have now with the arrangement of schedule and course offerings that we have and looking at that going, that's a pretty expensive section, right? And so can we structure that in a different way? And it's also, you know, the, the, the pushback, understandably, is that it's if you change to uh, a different model of delivery, it's a very different program. And so uh, it does limit, you know, Less is less. Uh, so if you offer less, then the the uh, opportunities for kids are less. And whether it's world language or mathematics or pick a topic, it it's really a, a variety. That was one where the the sort of class sections gave opportunity to to maybe think of it differently. And it does, you know, put uh, limitations on what kids are able to explore by the time they finish their senior year. I mean, obviously, we're we're always looking at opportunities to connect with with ecologists to do stuff. They, they're very good partners with us in that regard. Um, we have a variety of opportunities for kids. And so we try to do that um, when we can. Uh, you know, nice thing about AP classes is they sit during the school day. Um, in the languages in particular, they tend to be co-taught at the same time. So we'll have a, a section, a time of day that has both an AP class going on simultaneously with, you know, like a level four, or level five language class. So the classroom might have 15 students in it and, you know, five are in an AP class and 10 are in, in level five and the one teacher that's sort of straddling those two, those two worlds. And so we, we do, you know, do some economy along those lines to try to make things work for us as well. Um, you know, there's some limits to what that can do and what, what experience that is uh, for, for the kids. And, you know, if you offer less early in the process of, of world language, then 
you know, to get to an AP level requires uh, some significant choices by students uh, in their scheduling and their elective options as they as they go through to get to that place. In other words, if you wanted to get, you know, if you, you limit their choices to begin with, then to get to an AP level requires essentially what they call doubling up, um, which means, you know, instead of taking sort of one world language per year, you take two one year. Same thing happens in mathematics. Same thing can happen in, in other courses as well. Not optimal in a lot of ways. And in, and in some ways, uh, it's an option, but it's not you know, if you're taking two languages in a, in a year, that means there's some other elective you're not taking, right? So it is limiting your choices um, in some form or another, whether it be in world language or in, in, in some other option that you might have explored had you had more flexibility in your schedule. Council Hanneke? Yeah, um, the doubling up thing, I know this is not necessarily the finance committee's purview, but I do have to say that that's actually not possible for some of the languages. In, in my view. And so I think you have to be forthright about that. For Chinese, for example, I mean, unless you're going to allow someone to take Chinese one and Chinese two at the exact same time, same semester, same time, you can never double up in Chinese with the current way of Chinese offerings. Chinese one, two, and three are in the spring semester. Chinese four, five, AP, and culture and literature are in the fall semester. So unless you're taking one and two at the same time or two and three literally at the same time, which is probably not doable because you need one to take two, you can't double up and you can't take four before you take three. Um, so to say that that's a possibility when talking about the language cuts, I think is disingenuous. And I know that's not where finance deals with, but um, I think the school should be more forthright about what the middle school cut to languages would potentially mean in the future, which is for some languages, no AP, given the current schedule, unless the schedule changes. And I think that's the critical point that would be made would be that potentially the schedule could be differently. So the fact that we currently only offer one, you know, levels one, two, and three in the spring could be altered so as to allow kids the opportunity but it also depends on, you know, demand. Is there a sufficient level? You know, like if you have to offer level two in both the fall and spring, um, then, you know, you have to have uh, enough students to take it to make that worthwhile. But but it's a it's within the realm of possibility. But I, I, I get your point, though. It's it's also as currently structured. Would that allow you to get there? No. Um, and you can't simultaneously take one and two because you don't have the efficient foundational skill to do two if you haven't done one yet. So, you know, it, I get your point. And I think that the thinking uh, is that likely the, the, the avenue would be uh, to, to, uh, to alter the schedule to make that a possibility. I think the other thing that we have to weigh here as we think about this and we think about, and this is, it, and it doesn't matter that, you know, pick a program area and this is, is the conundrum is what are we offer? What can we offer? Um, and what uh, and how many students are impacted by those kinds of things? Um, and that's part of the calculus too. Is is when we start thinking about some of these uh, choices, and it's like we don't, you know, we don't want to put those limitations. And you know, is it better to have, you know, and I, I'm not throwing this as a as a value judgment at all. You know, it's like is it is it better to have AP Chinese or AP calculus of some sort versus class sections in ninth grade of 30 versus 22. I mean, that's some of the trade-offs that are happening with, with those differences um, that are all part of the mix of this and trying to find those balances between, between those things. Um, and that's the struggle we're going to have as our enrollment shrinks a little bit. And we want to try to continue to offer this wide spectrum of, of programs, which are great. And we'd love to, um, but we're we're going to have to think about that uh, very carefully over the coming years as to as to whether we can continue. Do we just have the student population to sustain um, some of the offerings we've had in the past, um, or are we, or do we, you know, do something else with school choice, or do we? I mean, I think we need to explore all of those, you know, ideas, um, you know, sort of simultaneously because you know, world language is the 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 area that got a lot of of conversation in in. Uh, the converse, you know, in the, in the last few months, it could have been about a different area. Um, you know, we could have been having it about 
math or social study offerings or any of the others. I think so. I, I don't want to, you know, hyper focus on on one. I think there's a more systemic thing we've got to look at and think about over the coming years to to, uh, to uh, you know structure ourselves in a way that that is uh, functional and as and as deep and as broad as we can do for all of our students. Yeah, I think. Uh, yeah, I want to just build on, as Bob said, he asked a, a complicated, almost three part question, but the 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 Amherst and UMass part of it, Doug, I know you've been over there at least once to say, um, can you offer us some financial help? And I know Amherst College does do some in kind work, particularly with uh, the elementary schools. Um, they had they gave me a list. But I'm really wondering about um, the higher level courses across the board. If we could have a, if there's been an exploration or could there be of the advanced placement courses, the ability to take a course. So um, what I know about is people who did physics, who did math. I'm not sure I knew anyone who did language, but I'm just thinking, you know, in my son's piece, but there is if you do languages, UMass is rich in the, the scope of languages that's offered. And I don't know how much union contracts preclude a student teacher um, who is going for a teaching degree in a language or in an area coming in and being lead teacher for an extra language course or something. But trying to think of what the valley, what our town is rich in, is edu other educational <laughs> institutions, and this they could write this up as in kind support if we had a more formal um, arrangement, and whether that could be done in time for September, or could be done with a this is our glide path and where we're going. So that's my longish question on seeing them as researchers research sources for particularly for our regional schools yeah i think that <clears throat> those are all areas of you know that we're interested in in continuing to explore and partner with them i mean you know we we do have to have and consider schedules uh when we have kids off campus at, you know it's like how quickly can they get there and get back and how does it fit um in ways that that have you know, meaning and and then when does when do the you know the colleges and university offer those classes too in other words we're, we're not going to dictate to the university how they're offering class now, granted something like world language which they do a, a lot of because all the you know all the arts and science majors have to take language so uh they offer a lot of sections of 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 various world languages so there's there's a lot of opportunity there but i think also that's a the, that schedule question is is a real one uh that we have to consider as a, as a part and parcel of this too um but um yeah, I think there's opportunities how quickly we can get something more formal than we, we have now. I mean, we have a few things in place in, in, at present. And, and I think um, I can kind of pose those questions and see what, what staff who've dealt with, with some of that, um, what, what complications arise when they try to, try to plug those things in. Thank you. Um, Doug, the, the committee ha has a, there's been a, a little bit of concern expressed about there there's apparently I, I, and don't take this the wrong way but the the apparent lack of planning in other words um we had this fiscal cliff coming it doesn't appear that you know it, it's suddenly on us now and now we have a a big hole in the budget and next year will be a bigger bigger hole um there's um you know we the, the school committee, the regional school committee, didn't really go through this at the four towns meeting before. You know, it kind of got sprung to us. So some of the questions that that we have are are related to kind of a, what what from the outside appears to be, you know, a, a lack of planning and a lack of, you know, uh, uh, understanding that you know we that there has to be some changes made in order to, you know, as ESSER funds were used for, for purposes, uh, as they were not available, we had to, you know, there has to be a, some plan to, to, to adjust for that. So anyway, I, I'm not, I don't take this to be pejorative. It's just, a, there is a concern about, you know, these things suddenly hitting us. 
Yeah, I would suggest, <clears throat> um, I wouldn't say they're suddenly hitting us. I think they've they've hit us a little bit over the last couple of years and, and will continue to hit us a little bit. I think that, um, you know, we have been trying to take some strategic approaches to how we've used, um, used our ESSER funding, how we've uh, used some of our other funds that we can um, leverage a little bit more control. So how we've used our school choice over the last couple of years, how we've used our, um, uh, our other uh, revolving funds. You know, we have a few revolving funds that, that we have intentionally built balances in, in order to, over the last couple of years, because we could use ESSER funds and then preserve those for smoothing out this, this, this drop. I don't think we're quite in as severe a place as some other districts. And yet it's still, a, you know, it's still a pretty significant uh, hit. And I think, um, I think from a, the other thing I'd say that's been, you know, compromising our ability to be planful about some of this is, you know, I've been splitting time as, as talented and capable and, you know, as, as staff are in the business office, you know, I'm, I'm still splitting some time there. There's a level of institutional knowledge I have um, that I haven't been able to share with them because there's only so many hours a day. And I think that, you know, when you look at a building principles built across two buildings in the middle school, high school, um, which we're trying to shift away from now, but but those things all contribute a little bit as well. So there's been a number of, of factors there that that have have you know interrupted or or um, made it difficult to be as as planful as we'd like to be. And I think that could we have been more more planful? Absolutely. I mean, I think we've done some things. I think we're um, you know we're leaning into that. If you look at in some materials I sent, you know, there's some things at the top that are adjustments where we're shifting costs onto revolving funds for for our Summit Academy, for um, some of our, our uh, uh, administrative staff, et cetera, that, that we're able to do that because we didn't spend those during the, the pandemic dollars uh, and we can sustain those for a little while um, to help us sort of bridge this time frame. And, and um, so there's a, you know, it's a mixed bag of, of things. Could we have done more? Absolutely, don't doubt it at all. And it's, it's, a, it's a tricky thing. I think the other thing is that, um, you know the the sort of revenue sources that we have um you know particularly chapter 70 have have really been very flat and the difficulty is given this you know that's you know a couple of years ago that was in the 31 percent of our revenue was chapter 70 it's now down to 27 28 percent you know when it goes up less than one percentage point our costs are going up whether they go four percent or they go up eight percent you know it, you're still behind when your revenue doesn't kind of keep pace so that's another thing that's kind of compounding and and in a way the the you know the ESSER funds uh as chapter 70 has been sort of flat as we've shifted funding to other districts in the in the commonwealth because the, the commonwealth has certainly spent more money on chapter 70 it's just been targeted to some districts that are really in, in a higher level of need than we are um you know the the ESSER funding has has made that shift less noticeable um, because we've been able to use ESSER funds to, to kind of um, alleviate that, that shortfall in, in, you know, direct support from the state. Um, and then I think that, you know, now that the ESSER funds are running out, that, that, you know, small percentage increase in, in revenue from the state is, is much more noticeable to us. Um, and, you know, that coupled with, you know, some of the revenue estimates from the state are lower, so they're much more cautious about their budget for fiscal 25, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a kind of compounding effect here. But but um, anyway, so I think there's there's some ways it's, it, you know, that revenue problem's been a little bit hidden because we've had ESSER funds to help us a little bit, um, but it's kind of becoming much more front and center at the, at the present time. Andy? Yeah, Doug, following up on what you just said, I think that uh, those of us who've watched the budget year for year over a long period of time know that what happens each year is that we start with the district calculating the level services budget from the prior year and finding out the size of the gap based upon information at the four towns meeting and then finding what the gap is and there seems to be always um, more reductions than uh, additions or um, anything else 
So what it's really evident is that over a long course of time, uh, the, in, the inflation each year in cost is exceeding the inflation in revenue. And uh, that gets to the, then to the question of uh, what caused us to reach such a steep cliff this year, or was it just a matter that it was going to happen and this is the year it happened? And then the other thing is that um, I was uh, I had talked with John Tricky in Pelham, and John said that he had been asking about a three-year plan to see what uh, we could expect to happen over the next three years, uh, given uh, what's being asked of this year. And uh, is that something that we're going to be able to see on Saturday? Yes. So <clears throat> we're working on that right now and, and looking at that. I mean, there's, there's a ton of assumptions that fall into that that are going to make people a little, you know, uncomfortable because there's a lot of, you know, unknowns in there. But, but at the same time, we're going to do the best we can to sort of estimate those, those things out over a couple of years' time to, to sort of see um, uh, either compounding effects or, or uh, you know, the, the reduction of compounding effects on some things. You know, I don't see the... Chapter 70 revenue, unless there's a major change to, to Chapter 70 or, you know, if, if the uh, if the Student Opportunity Act continues to play out as as it will over the next couple of years, you know, I don't see that revenue source is suddenly getting much, much better. So we're going to be, um, you know, still in a, in a somewhat revenue starved circumstance relative to our expenses. And while we have declining enrollment, I'm not sure it, it you know, and, and some of how we've we've coped in past years is is that you know we've had some of the reductions make sense relative to declining enrollment so you know the the uh need to be exactly level services isn't always perfectly true if we have a if we have reductions in number of kids um but yeah we'll put together some numbers uh and project out for the next couple of years and sort of see how things look you know in in different scenarios of of um of revenue uh, and, and expense and, and how that, you know, uh, might play out in the, in the coming years. Um, we were literally, I mean, had multiple conversations literally today, just talking about how do we, how do we sort of present this? How do we make sure the numbers are right? What kind of assumptions do we want to include or not include? Um, and that sort of thing to, to, to get those numbers for, for the whole group on Saturday. Yeah, Doug, to, to, just to, to cut, follow up on that a little bit, um, one of the, the questions that, that is is in this sheet is the the sort of impact of changes in the middle school to the high school. You know, in other words, if you reduce languages in the middle school, how does that impact the high school? Uh, and so I would hopefully your your assumptions will take that into account uh, that, you know, if we make certain cuts in the middle school, then or we support, you know, we, we add certain things in the middle school, then then we have to, this what's, is what the impact of, in the high school is. So, because uh, that's another dynamic there. That Yeah, <clears throat> as best we can, we'll try to put that in. It, it may be a little broader cut than that. There's, some, there's a number of things that have very sort of broad <laughs> um, uh, assumptions associated. So sometimes something more specific like that is a little harder to track in a real way. Um, but at the same time, we're going to try to capture the the intent of that as we move as we move through the years. Okay, thank you, uh, Councilor Haneke. Um, a couple things with this conversation. So the first one is much more of a not not related to this at all. But I was looking for just now the line item budget. And it's not on the town's website, or the school's website under the budget office, under budget links at all. When you go through the business office budgets and all of that, the last budget you get is the FY24 one in documents, unless I'm looking in the wrong area. It's very hard to find on the school's website. Um, I did eventually find it in a January presentation in board docs, um, not with the budget hearing, it was not attached to the uh, meeting where the region school had their budget hearing. Only the presentations were and the final like one pager. 
Um, I, I think that lack of openness is a problem. It should be easily found. Um, I, it shouldn't take me 20 minutes to find. Um, um, yeah. You know, it should be attached to every agenda where the budget is discussed um, in some sense or easily found on a website. And it wasn't easily found. But but that that's for, you know, for future planning. Um, when we talk about cuts and we talk about level services, um, the level services budget you presented that then had cuts um, never got adjusted for things like lower insurance rates. That got adjusted and was presented as an adjustment at the end of level services, but there's no change to levels. There's no change to services when insurance is cheaper than you projected in January in June, you know, in April when the insurance rates came out and we knew what they were, the budget document was not changed to reflect lower insurance rates. It was listed somewhere at the end, three documents later as an adjustment. But that makes the level services budget look higher than a level service budget actually is. And I think that presents a lot of problems for us trying to really figure out what, when you're trying to compare documents and compare years and compare percentage increases, what an actual level services budget is, because we never see that number um, in, in flat out numbers in a sense. And, and one of the things that I've struggled with throughout all of these discussions in my five years is the town the town government side has also had to live with a 3% or a 4% increase every year in its operating budget. And it's presented a level services budget within that number every year um, without ne need for major or any real cuts to personnel, despite personnel also being the very significant part of our budget that it is to the region too. The region's level services budget was over 8% increase this year. And so I, I'm trying to struggle and I struggle with, and I'd like your take on why can, why is a region's level services budget consistently well above the three or 4% that the town can regularly offer basically every year when the town can do it or even when the elementary school could kind of do it this year, what what is different about the region that the region can't seem to keep its level services within what is typically known as the available or likely increase every year in operating, you know, in that budget number, while the town and even the elementary school seems to be closer to being able to do that? So I'll, I'll, uh, I'll start with the, 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 um, the first thing, which was the sort of finding the line by line. I'm sorry that it wasn't posted into the, into the budget document section of, of the website. Again, one of those things that, that we haven't done. We generally only do sort of two versions of that full, uh, that full budget because it takes a while to put together. So when we go to make those reductions and adjustments, those are specific oftentimes, sometimes they're single lines within the budget, sometimes they're multiple lines. For example, when we, if you're looking at like um, uh, reductions in, in, you know, so the teaching staff ones that were, were proposed, you know, this might hit three or four different budget lines. And you have to sort of parse those across those budget lines and, and, and then make sure things add up to the bottom and that sort of thing. Um, so we typically do, um, when we get to it, is the, the sort of, first version of the budget and then the final version of the budget. And that's why things like adjustments to health insurance are shown as an adjustment to the budget. And I would agree with you that that's part of why we have an adjustment section. It's not considered a cut. And I think to say that adjustments that reduce the costs, like uh, most of the things that are in the adjustment section are, are truly uh, shifts to the, to the level services. I agree with you that the, that the level services in its truest sense would, would have those folded in directly and, and ultimately do before we, before we get um, uh, to the final, uh, final version of the budget. Um, we typically, like I said, when we get the, the final uh, adjustments and, and votes from everyone, we, we do uh, take all of those adjustments 
and the cuts and or additions and and uh, push them into the specific budget lines. And so, you know, when we did that for fiscal uh, 24, for example, you know, if you look at the health insurance line, that's adjusted from from what it was, you know, in January of 23, when we were talking about the same kind of uh, estimate of, of cost and then real cost. So we, we do it. Uh, it just doesn't happen very, you know, in a super timely way. And I'm sorry that you couldn't couldn't find it. Um, um, anyway, so to the second question, why is it, you know, the, the, you know, the regional budget, particularly the sort of uh, overall expenses uh, are growing at that rate? Um, I, there's a few different pieces of the puzzle. So, so I'll say this. So um, as a support for the budget is one piece of it. So that's a component of, of the cost of, you know, we got 8.29% or something in our overall increase there. Some of it's, like you say, adjustments to, 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 um, you know, health insurance and some of those other things that actually make it not 8.29% in, in real numbers. Um, so that's a subtlety of it and timing of, of, of presentation, but, um, so it's a piece, ESSER's a piece because of the shift in, in the amount of available funds from ESSER. Um, so the current fiscal 24 budgets getting supported by about $1.1 million in ESSER funds. Um, which means the expense side of the equation is about a million dollars higher than than would be the case. Um, and this coming year, it's it's five hundred thousand. So there's six hundred thousand dollars of that, you know, eight point three percent that are just the differential of ESSER funding available. So that's part of what drives it. I think the other things we start to see is is you know uh, we negotiate contracts with employees. Um, you know, depending on what the colas are, that makes a difference. The other thing is that. You know, we've gotten younger as an organization. Um, so the number of staff we have at the top step, which would be just getting if, you know, just for those that don't know, we have steps and colas. So if you are new hire, you tend not to be at the very top step. And so when you uh, from one year to the next tend, tend to get a cost of living increase as well as a step increase. Um, and then for staff that have been with us a while, they end up at the top of the grid. And so they're they're just in cost of living increases. So, you know, when you have uh a younger staff so you have fewer people at the top of 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 the grid you've got a higher level of inflation and pressure year over year um and i've seen that over the time i've been with the district so when i started with the district we had oh just shy of about 70 percent of our staff were at the top staff now we're probably closer to 50 um and depending on which department so that puts a little more inflationary pressure on things um you know and, and what we can negotiate with our staff is is a factor too um and it's, you know, I mean, it's a fair negotiation. So, you know, we go into it, we, you know, sort of press the point to try to, you know, make sure that the, the choices we're making collectively around that bargaining is, is, you know, fully understood. In other words, when we negotiate the cost of living that has a, you know, a, a cascading effect in, in, you know, every year after that. Um, and that's regardless of which contract we're in. So we, we try to keep that in mind. So I think, you know, we, we've got, as there's one piece of the puzzle, I think that we've got um, a younger staff. You see that on the Amherst side, not as much um, on some of that. You know, the, the, the ESSER differential is smaller. The, the staffing differential is smaller. Um, we've got some standalone expenses that are greater in, in the region because it is a separate standing financial entity. Um, there's ways in which, you know, a, a, a municipal district sort of shares some costs with the town and, and has some economy of, of scale there with, with the town. I think the other thing, uh, just back to sort of how the town does some of its reductions, um, you know, staff turnover may be a factor for them. Um, it sometimes helps us as well. I mean, they may have more of that. I think the other thing is, is that they don't present their budget the same way. So we, they may be making reductions or changes, uh, before level services gets sort of framed, and I don't, I don't say that as a, as a, as a negative approach or, or a critique of, of the town and how they function, but, but they may be, and I don't know for certain offhand, you know, how they, how they've done it recently, but how they frame, you know, sort of level services could be different. I mean, we, we take a snapshot in you know, November essentially to get started. That's a pretty early snapshot and a lot of things change. Um, they may not be taking a snapshot as early. I think there's a general higher level of stability in their staffing and, uh, you know, the knowns and unknowns because, um, 
you know, we have a dependency on who the students are and what their needs are. And so that changes things for us a little bit and creates a little more of a dynamic situation as far as staffing. And, and we just have a lot more people, you know, the town hires and has on staff, you know, a couple hundred, we have about just, you know, 600 and some odd across all three districts. I should be clear on that, but I think all of those are factors in the, in the puzzle. Kathy. <clears throat> No, I, I'm okay. Sorry, it's a leftover. Leftover. Okay. Um, you've gone. You've touched on a lot of these other issues. Um, Bob, I do have one. I have a question. I mean, this is uh, this is uh, because there were headlines over in Northampton. If if the union would reopen the contract and take a one year freeze just on the COLA. Is there any estimate on what the savings is for that? And again, you can't answer that off the bat, but I, I'm just thinking of, you know, if the, um, what you just described as with more people moving up the steps, it doesn't mean people are on a freeze necessarily. A lot of people aren't on a freeze. They're they'll be progressing up a step. So it's a, it's kind of a, how many people are at the top where this would be a genuine freeze. And I know it was a really difficult contract negotiation to get to yes. Um, so it's, it's, it, and some of this was brought up during those negotiations with the revenues or for the school chapter 70 are only going up by this much. If the cost of people working there goes up by a lot more it's going to hit positions, but I, I just, if, if there is a rough way of getting that number, that would be useful. And I don't need it now. Actually, I, I did look at that. Um, and you're, you're suggesting a 0% COLA versus what's currently in the, in the contracts. I mean, um, it clearly, it clearly there's something between zero and what's in the contract. There's half of right. it. Or, but yeah. Right. And I, um, yeah. Broadly speaking, and this is a very broad, um, you know, the difference between zero and 3% COLA across uh, is in the $500,000 range, just to broadly, probably a little higher than that, but that gives you the sort of order of magnitude there. Okay, that's fine. Thanks very much. The, the, the other thing I'll say though is, I mean, part of the, the you know, the negotiations and, and the urgency, understandably on the, on the staff's part is, you know, we're all experiencing inflation, you know, in, in recent years of, you know, seven, eight percent. So, you know, there's, there's a reason why nobody's happy about inflation because it makes us all poor and, and it hits people hard. And, and, uh, and so, you know, when we talk about things like, oh, our health insurance going up 9.74 percent, yeah, we as a district carry a big chunk of that cost, but the individual employees who have health insurance with us also have their rates go up that same percentage. And so, that bites it out of out of their out of their you know cola, and so that it, it's a difficult um, conundrum um, ar around that. But I I I totally uh, I had a ten year history of being on the union side, so yes, I completely understand that. But it was just a, a question on 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 where a stopgap to get us through a year might be um, that saves positions. So thanks. Yeah, there were, we also had some questions. Uh, there's some questions in here about, you know, kind of because Amherst is part of the four towns entity, um, what happens if like Amherst decides to do something, but the other towns don't. And I know there's the, the three quarter, the, the three and the four, but I mean, you know, if we were to, you know, somehow add some money and the others towns didn't add it, add it, would we then, would that throw things off um, in terms of, you know, E and D balances? And, you know, if there is an, an excess of that, what percent gets returned to what town and all that? Is there, is there a way to deal with that or is it just is unprecedented? So you don't really have a, a process for it. Well, actually, you know, a, a couple of years ago, um, after the fiscal year had started, Amherst found itself in a in a positive circumstance with with their revenue uh, or expenses. I'm not sure which, but 
they had additional funding available and they did a, a mid-year appropriation to each of the departments, not just not just the schools. Um, when they did that, you know, the, the regional schools took that as a gift. Um, and at the direction of, of the finance director, he said, let's let's include that in the base for the moving forward. Um, and so it, it kind of depends on that question about whether it starts to mess with the sort of balance of things. If, if we do, uh, if Amherst for whatever reason, uh, outside the assessment method appropriates a chunk of money to the, to the district, um, you know, sort of a core question is, do you want us to count that as part of the base? In other words, when we go to say, oh, it's a 3% increase from last year, are we counting that gift or are we not counting that gift? It's a critical question. And, and I think that um, that makes a, a big difference, you know, for, for all the calculations and it, and it does, uh, and it does shift things. And other, you know, I think the other towns are considering that kind of an option as well as like, you know, might we do a, a, a non-assessment type of, of appropriation? Uh, I think the critical question is when we go to do fiscal 26, do we, do we consider that part of your base assessment or not? Um, if you consider it as part of the base assessment, then, you know, it tends to not create quite the same problems because the revenue is sort of projected to be there. Um, if it's, if on the other hand, it's considered entirely separate from that, then we've got that gap of, of funding to fill uh, much like when the ESSER money runs out. So it's, there's good and bad about it. Okay. Well, that, that's a, I mean, I, we, we have a lot of other, there, there's some other specifics in there, but it's, it's not worth going, going through all of them right now. I think, does anyone else have some general questions about that for, for Doug? Okay. I don't see any. Um, I don't have a, a general question, but, um, so I don't repeat Ma Mandy's search for the more detailed document. Doug, if you could just send us a link. I've never quite figured out where to go when I go to the ARP site for something. Um, and when I just did ARPs and budget, I found 2018 information. So, you know, I, I, know, I know the difficulty of keeping up sites, but if you, do, you could just keep this link because I know you had told us um, at the four towns meeting that the total charter enrollment and what we spend on charter is in that document. And I was able to go to the DESE site and get charter dollars, net dollars, total dollars and people dollars for both our, our um, regional and elementary. And I think even having, taking in half that amount whole, keeps us whole as a region, you know, so I know that's not gonna happen by September, but $2 million when we're sending 21-ish net versus 5,000 when we go to a district school, if we went to 10, it's suddenly a huge amount of money multiplied on the kids. So I think not enough people know that information and you've done a pretty good job on talking about chapter 70 um, almost being flat as opposed to growing. So it's a shrinking share, but that's part of what has been the pressure because of the declining enrollment. But that's a chart. The charter issue is a very different issue. It's the basic funding of charters was set up in a way that that hurts. Um, and it doesn't hurt just Amherst. It hurts uh, some of the other regional schools as well. Um, and, it, and it's completely out of our control. So I just think, um, I, if you could send me the link, it's useful for me, for me to have the detail. And once I find the link, maybe I'll be able to find it again because I keep links. So that would be great. Thank you. Yep. Absolutely. Councilor Haneke? Yeah. Um, a mix of questions, sort of, which is, so there's the region budget that was passed that we are considering right now and then what i call i'm calling for ease of or lack of a better term the guidelines budget um, which is seven hundred thousand lower i mean there's i just don't lack of a better term um the budget we thought we'd be looking at until the region passed something seven hundred thousand higher um what if any planning is going on in your offices and with the school committee in case the region budget is not passed 
um, because of budget deadlines of June 30 and all, um, is the plan, is there a plan? If that plan is to present the cuts as presented previously, I believe when the school committee asked, um, are there other places to potentially cut spending to meet the guideline budget? Your response was no. Um, I, I think, I don't know. Um, what, what other places did you consider for potential cuts or how did you go about making those decisions of getting to there versus other things. For example, I I briefly looked at this and athletics has more expenses than the revolving fund and revenue. Um, I don't know where those expenses get paid from, whether that's the general fund budget for the school district. If it is, was there a consideration of looking at athletics becoming revenue neutral um, instead of expense, you know, instead of an expense line um, as part of the cuts? Or were there other places that you looked and disregarded? Or how, how did you go about doing that? And is there a plan to revisit that? Or is there in planning now a potential to revisit that if the school committee budget is not adopted by four towns? So I think, <clears throat> so just so the difference between sort of uh, um, the conversation we had in February at the Four Towns meeting versus the, the budget that was voted at, at school committee, that difference is about, um, I'll tell you exactly, $941,975 uh, higher. Um, we're still reducing almost $750,000. You know, a fair number of that is is adjustments, which are, 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 uh, are you know, changes to the actual um, uh, level services budget. So to your point earlier, um, you know, nonetheless, you know, there's about 300,000 of that, about half or so of that 750 are, are, are uh, adjustments and refinements of, of, of uh, estimates of cost, but the other half of it is broadly is, is other reductions in other places. Um, uh, and so, you know, we, we had, uh, and have some open positions or positions that will be open as as a result of retirements in this in uh, some places throughout the district. So we looked at those. Um, you know, we know we have certain um, uh, cost increases in in our expenses. Um, you know, we look through all of those. We do we do as we build the budget, we go through sort of every line and look at sort of past history. And 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 there are some areas where you know. Uh, you know, you look and and it might not have had this bit, you know, we have like $3,500 and then we've only spent a thousand the last three years, but then, you know, there's some other line right near it that might have spending that we have, you know, sort of back and forth. So there's a point where we kind of think in terms of the totality of given sections um, with, with, you know, history as our guide in, in, in many ways. And there's a lot of those that you just, you can't zero out. And, you, you know, like we know we have property insurance and property insurance as a whole, you know, sort of industry-wide, pretty significantly increasing over the next couple of years. Um, recent history with our other kinds of insurance are, are driving costs up. So, so when we really want to make a difference in, in our budgets, it's often driven by, by people because um, the, the things that are of, of uh, a more flexible nature in our, in our sort of raw expenses are, you know, A, they're, they're much smaller component of our budget, um, and, a, and a number of them are not you know, very movable. So we still got to heat the buildings. We still got to pay for electricity um, and other utilities. So those things don't have a lot of wiggle as far as making reductions. You know, we have, um, you know, curriculum materials we have to buy. We, you know, still got to purchase some paper and whiteboard markers and that stuff. You know, those don't have a lot of movement. And even if you, even if you zeroed them out, um, you know, you're talking in the hundreds of thousands, you know, a couple hundred thousand, maybe at most, if you zero them out and you couldn't have school, there's things, some of those things you'd have to buy anyway. So uh, you can't really zero them out. But, but um, you know, we looked at all of those, uh, specifically athletics, we have, you know, most of that cost is carried by the program and the fees. Um, we haven't adjusted the, the fees um, over the last couple of years, that's on our agenda for this fall to look at those fees. Uh, currently, we carry just a few salaries in in the budget, um, and again, that's one of those areas where uh, 
over the course of the pandemic, we built some balance in that revolving fund to help us out. Um, and then we'll we'll review the sort of structure of of our our um, uh, our fees for that uh, to see what what we can do as far as generating a little more revenue there. Um, but I think all of those are are all of those things that are of that sort are are all under consideration. Um, most of them at this point are are ones we can't take action on right away, and and even you know, and most of the ones that we have some some ability to do that is. We have our will and their small you know differences at this point um you know i think as an organization we're going to have to look more deeply at systemic kinds of changes um which are harder longer term kind of things but i think you know if you just sort of look out at the the coming years and this will be part of the messaging we'll see you know barring significant changes in some revenue sources uh we got to think about how we're structured differently and what that entails and and it, it takes a bit to think about those things that really um fundamentally shift the paradigms that we use. Um, and those those take time and energy to kind of explore and, and dig into and, and evaluate um, and think about what their impact are. So it gets back to Bob's question earlier about sort of, hey, if we make this change in world language in seventh grade, what happens three years from now when those kids start to get to the high school and want to take whatever? It's like, what 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 are those impacts? Um, so, so we definitely want to try to, to look at those kinds of, of longitudinal uh, impacts as well when we make those those reductions. Um, I think if I got to the other points that I wanted to make on that front, but um, yeah, we definitely. I mean, we look through, you know, and and try to find things. There's, you know, there are you know needs that that we have to invest in, um, you know we have to continue to sort of work on and chip away at in much the same way we think about capital and wanting to spend regularly on capital so that we don't get too far behind. There are things we do in a similar way within our operating budget around, you know, things like evaluating curriculum um, that we want to think of that in a similar way. It's like, oh, well, do we need to invest in a new curriculum for this? Uh, does that have a, 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 a grant opportunity that allows us to and or does it have a bunch of materials that need to go with it that we're going to need to plan and budget for. Um, so I think we, we have to think about some of those things too as we go ahead as what what things do we need to do to stay uh, in, a, in a regular cycle of, of improvement. That's what Hannah So I, I don't wanna put words in your mouth, <laughs> um, but uh, something you just said struck me and it's part of sort of some of the questions I think we asked about planning, which, which it, did I did I interpret what you said? Am I interpreting correctly that 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 systemic log, longitudinal planning um, around cuts hasn't been done? And does that actually mean that the cuts that were proposed for the guidelines budget, the nine hundred thousand less than the school committee voted, um, that those cuts were not? longitudinally thought of in terms of how those would impact budgets but not but not just budgets but the educational system and offerings going forward into the three four five years from now were they really just what's easiest to do in the here and now instead of a truly thought out plan over the long term knowing that this cliff has needed a plan it did am i interpreting what you just said in is is what i just said sort of in the correct vein of the cuts that were proposed to the teaching staff were not were were potentially the easiest to make in the here and now without necessarily regard to a four five or six year plan in educational philosophy planning and offerings in that longitudinal sense that you thought of of system you spoke about of systemic strategic planning and that hasn't been done with these cuts is that I, correct I would, so i would offer it differently i think i think that that longer view is a part and parcel of all the process we take all the time so i, I don't think it's we, we've been absent of doing that at all i think however um, if you look at sort of churn in administration, so that's a pretty critical piece when we start talking about 
um, you know, building level decisions, when you have change in, in staffing, it, it's at, at the administrative level, both at the building level and centrally, that makes it harder to do them well and to have consistency across that and stability in those, in those evaluations of longitudinal impact. So I think it's a little bit of both. So I think that, that while we need to do that and continue to do that, and it is something we always do, I think, uh, have we done it at the depth that we'd like to have over the last year or two? Probably not. Um, we've been we've been on to some other topics and had some churn and some staffing that, that make it difficult to do that well. Um, that's not to say it doesn't happen. I think it just it's it's difficult to do at the deepest deepest levels would be maybe the way I would phrase that. Um, so I think it's it's I agree and disagree with you simultaneously. I guess is is so what I would say. Okay, and sorry one one more quick then follow up. Um, if we were to fund the regional school budget this year with a, but those longitudinal plans need done say, or even if we weren't, how do we, how do we guarantee that that happens? Like, like what, how do we know that what you're saying is necessary and needs to be done would actually be done? Well, I think that's, <clears throat> There's a couple of things. So certainly, you know, my expectation is if we hire a superintendent, I'll go back to business office. So I'm hearing this directly from you guys. And so from from my lens, that's certainly a piece of the puzzle. But I think it's also important for you guys to share that point of view with superintendent candidates and with a new superintendent, because it's going to be critical for them to understand the context in which they operate and and uh, get that feedback from from you know the sort of member towns, so I think it's a twofold piece. I mean, obviously, I'm here, I'm hearing it, I'm thinking about it, have been thinking about it, um, and and one of the advantages, you know, I mentioned earlier, where you know there's some things that I'm still sort of carrying as a business official and you know institutional knowledge, that kind of stuff, and the skills we're building with some of my staff are going to be helpful for them to be able to kind of dig in and 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 work on some of this. However, it's a pretty critical conversation with the buildings and those administrations and staff. Uh, in concert with 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 the superintendent to to really think about that um you know impact and 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 strategic planning for for multiple years so i think sharing that with those superintendent candidates and asking those sort of kind of questions of them are are pretty critical kathy the, my question doug i i feel like we've really put you on the hot seat but um mine is uh, slightly off from the pure regional budget, um, from my uh, switching onto my hat of do elementary school is going to be grades K through five, and the sixth grade is supposed to move up to the regional school. And the there was an, a designation of 500, an offer of $500,000 of ARPA money to help smooth the way. And what I'm uh, what I had understood is some of that was going to go to redoing some bathrooms. There might have been some painting, some other things getting ready. But the regional region said not ready yet. So what my worry is, if you're not ready yet, but the money goes away and you need the money next year, where's it going to come from? Because when the new school opens up in 2026, uh, the plan is there isn't a sixth grade moving into it. So I just don't know where that fits in the um, overwhelming larger budget picture that you're facing for next year. But this is a piece that's not that far down the road. So the ARPA money, and I just want to end with the ARPA money has not been spent yet. It's been designated. So it, it hasn't gone away. If the dis, And my understanding is if there were a fairly concrete plan of what to do with it, before the end of December. And most of it would be spent before the end of December 2026. Um, we can we, we be using the ARPA money. So it doesn't mean it has to be spent um, before. And since the new school is supposed to open in September 2026, that money would likely. So I just, I'm hoping you go back and think about it. I, I asked the town manager and he said, if they said they don't have time to use it right now or they, you know, they don't have a plan for it. But I think the town is in on the ARPA money side has that one time money 
to help with that. Um, so I'll stop. But that, but that's both a comment and an uh, with a sense of urgency about it because I don't want to find out a year from now we're not ready. So physically, yeah, yeah physically yeah. ready to bring them in. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that you know the the Amherst School Committee is certainly um, very keen to 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 get started on the you know or or restarted on planning process, and so I think we'll. You know, and as a matter of fact, one of the things I need to get done this week because they want to talk about it next Tuesday when they meet um, a little bit is is sort of where we sit with sixth grade move and what that's going to take. And and um, not that we have answers to those questions, but we know we have to do that. Uh, we also have to consider simultaneously the the, the merging of three schools into two um, over the next couple of years simultaneously with that. So there's a whole host of those larger um, uh systemic planning kinds of things we need to do relative to this. And, and so, um, you know, if the ARPA funds are available still. Um, I mean, it, I mean, I mean that they haven't been spent and, you right. know, a, a part of it was just with the, um, there was uh, conceptually adding a million more to the Fort River school parking lot of solar panels because mm -hmm. we had a million, but that, it turns out that can't go into the contract right away. So I'm just saying that that money, there's not a contract for it yet. So if some right. of what you need for the sixth grade is capital money, you know, one time this needs to happen before they can physically move into the school, I think um, making that a high priority would be a good thing because our the town's capital budget is really tight. Um, right. So... Uh, Bob has just been, <laughs> it's not like there's another $500,000 to be grabbed next year. It's right. it, it's in a deficit next year right now, given the request. But in any case, um, yeah. so I just wanted to emphasize, don't forget that piece of the larger puzzle. And originally the thought was it might help with some of the enrollment and class size that if some of the sixth graders were taking a Spanish course, were taking this course or that course. It's a few more kids in a classroom that might ma make those electives viable. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, as we get back into to earnestly planning for that sixth grade mm -hmm. move, that's all part and parcel of what we're going to be thinking about for sure. Thank you. Andy? Yeah, I just uh, was going to suggest to move this along. Um, I really appreciate the amount of time that Doug has spent and uh, with us. And um, this has been a very rich conversation. There are a lot of things that uh, have been happening within the schools, Doug. And uh, you know, I think that you got cast in the role and I'm so appreciative that you accepted the role of being the acting superintendent when you did. Um, and it was just an awful time in just this huge combination of circumstances that we don't have to recount because you know them and live them. Um, but uh, I wanted to thank you for, um, but uh, I was going to suggest to the chair that we try and um, cap the time that we're asking now of Doug and uh, see if we need to get along to uh, public comment and concluding our meeting. Yeah, I was going to do that, but thanks, Andy. So thank you, Doug. Uh, you can stay for public comment if you want, but you don't need to. So I may step away, but thank you all. I appreciate the questions. And and there's some of the same ones that I have and try to think about regularly. So uh, I, I appreciate them. And and uh, and and I'll I'll look. You may have sent those to me. And I may have missed them. And no, no, I'll get I'll, I'll get them to you, Doug. I'll, I'll... Okay. Well, we'll get them filled out and, and sit back to you guys as quickly okay. as we can so you can can think through your your budget okay absolutely thanks thank you all right so i'm going to open uh the meeting to, please to... let matt back in oh, okay sorry whoever's here matt and the attendees I'm just, I I think I'm the only one who had, was granted the power and I'm, Mandy, do you still see him in the audience? No, oh, I do not. Maybe he left. I don't think I can bring him in then. <laughs> I'm sorry. I just wanted to make sure if he was still here that we brought him in before public comment. Okay. 
Unless okay, so on I see I yeah. see one hand and um it's a phone number. So I'm going to allow phone number four one three five four nine zero eight one zero to talk. Hi, could you please identify yourself and uh where you live, just broadly speaking? Yeah, uh, Vince O'Connor, one seventy five Summer Street in Amherst. So I've I've listened to the entire meeting. I have a number of comments. And um, I'll try to go through them as quickly as I can. One, I wanted just to recall to the Finance Committee my comments from last time about um, competition. The schools face competition. The services provided by the town do not. Um, you don't drive out of your driveway and decide, well, do I want to drive on the Amherst roads or the Hadley roads or the Belchertown roads? No. We take... We have to live with what we get from the from the town, but the schools, um, if they don't provide the services, then one, they people go elsewhere, and that has really bad social impacts. Um, as as more of the parents decide to put their kids in private schools, and it's very bad impact on the in, the entire town. So second, I I just want to say about uh, cooperation with Amherst College and UMass, that's really, a, I think, a multi-year, at least one or two, but probably two or three year deal that um, really has to fall on the new superintendent. And, um, and with regard to the chair's comments about wanting to understand the impact on the foreign language budget of the budget cuts, I sat through the entire public hearing that was conducted by the school committee. That hearing was recorded. Um, the comments about the, especially about the foreign language program were very concrete, specific, um, and, um, and they had a lot to do with the decision of the school committee uh, with regard to the budget. Those, uh, that meeting was recorded. It is available online. And I would strongly recommend it for any member of the finance committee who wants to understand what the cuts, the impact of the cuts would have. Um, with regard to presentations, I, I, I've looked at the 2018 finance committee booklet for the last town meeting, and I really recommend that others do the same because I think some of the presentation material regarding the regional schools in that budget book um, should be being transferred to the presentations uh, in this in this time, um, both by the administration to the school committee and and to uh, and to you all. Um, I I do think that with regard to this budget, that the finance committee needs to keep in uh, in mind that have a new superintendent, a new middle school principal, and um, I think they, those two hirings are essential for the district to function uh, effectively and properly, and I think nothing would destroy the district's chances of actually hiring somebody than to have the kind of uh, draconian teacher cuts that that will result from a reduction in the school committee's budget. Um, so, um, and and I think in terms of capital things with regard to the town and the region, um, I'm I'm at a loss to understand why, and and I don't expect a response right now, but to understand why. Um, there has not been uh, money forthcoming to, to solarize the high school parking lot and maybe the middle school parking lot. I just, um, given the fact that it actually leads to expenditure reductions in the out years for energy, I, I don't understand why that, why money hasn't been able to become up, been set aside for that. Finally, I have questions for. Uh, and, and maybe Doug is gone, but I think it would be useful for the Finance Committee, since the House budget is out, um, there appears to be perhaps another 
100,000 that will go to the region um, between 75 and 100,000. And so I, I think that's another adjustment that has to be made. The budget will be, I think, be debated next week, and all the school things, I think, will be settled by that time. Um, and, um, and, and so the, and my question for the Finance Committee, which I think is something that the Finance Committee should really think about because the, the question is on many people's minds, is the, the town reserves, the, the regional school reserves are 1.1 million, and they're going to use, I think, five or 600,000 of that for the, for the present budget. Uh, for the fiscal 25 budget, um, the t the town, the municipal reserves are over 20 million, and what will remain of the seven, what would be a 740 thousand dollar deficit, I think, is down somewhere in the six, maybe in the 650 range at this point, given the house budget. And the question is, what percentage of the reserves? because I don't know the actual number for the um, free cash and, and other, other funds that are available. Um, what is the actual percentage that the regional school budget um, ask uh, above the, the guideline budget um, would be? In other words, is it, uh, it, it appears as though it's in the three to 4% range. In other words, that that one year thing that would allow a new superintendent to come in and try to write what I think has been a, a rudderless ship for many years um, uh, would um, I think be a wise expenditure of money um, and with the clear understanding that what it can't can't come back the next year with the same problem. But um, there are transportation and administrative issues related to the last minute promotions and elevations that happened with the prior superintendent that are going to have to be, somebody new is gonna to have to deal with that. Okay, and, thank you, um, thank you very much. You need to wrap up your comments. But yeah, so I will, and I, I, so I would just, uh, I would urge the, the finance committee to look at what the final number is going to be based on the house, at least on the house budget, and what percentage that would be of the the uh, actual reserves of that are available. Um, I think that's an important number, and I think we could have a meaningful conversation if that number were on the table. Okay, thank you, <clears throat> um, Maria. Uh, please uh, state your name and where you live. Thank you, Maria Kapicki, South Amherst. I'm going to talk about a different issue. Um, this past fall, the Finance Committee and the Town Council held many discussions before they took votes to authorize $46 million for the library project. One of the things that came out of these meetings was a cash flow analysis that was supposed to indicate when the town would receive and spend money. Since then, a lot has happened and a lot hasn't happened but no public body is talking about any of it. The construction bid deadline was set originally for February 28, but this deadline has been pushed back twice so far, first to April 16, then to April 23. That's a two month delay. There have been 19 addenda so far to the initial construction documents, the most recent posted today after the subcontractor bids were received and including multiple sections being replaced in their entirety. Potential bidders have thus far submitted 97 requests for information. When the decision about borrowing was made in the fall, the schedule from the OPM showed a March 2024 construction start and August 2025 completion. In February, the OPM schedule showed a three month delay in construction, projected to start in June 2024 with completion in November 2025. This latest, however, was produced before the move to a temporary location was pushed out to mid-May. There's been no discussion about what the financial impacts of these delays are. 
Subcontractor bids were also pushed back and were finally received last week. There were no bidders for the elevator, so that has to be folded into the general contractor's contract. And there was only one bidder for HVAC, fire protection, and metals. For two others, electrical and roofing, there were only two bidders. In the meantime, the library has failed to meet its promised payment to the town. Less than $250,000 of the $2 million it said it would pay by January 1st was received on time and $900,000 remains in arrears. If the remainder is not paid before the town has to borrow to pay for construction, interest on those short-term borrowings will presumably be even higher than the more than three quarter of a million dollars I was estimated in November. This is a public project and the financial implications of all these issues must be addressed publicly. But through all of these past several months, to my knowledge, no one on the town council or finance committee has demanded any updates and no information has been forthcoming. The Jones Library Building Committee has met only once on January 4, more than three months ago. Multiple deadline shifts, multiple addenda, scores of RFIs, delinquent payments of almost a million dollars, and our elected representatives and town officials are completely silent. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I believe Mika McGee. Please uh, state your name and where you live. Hi, Lamiko. Oops, I'm sorry. I, Ramika, run, raise your hand again. I removed the wrong, I hit the wrong button. <laughs> Here we go. Gotcha. You're back. Back. Right. You guys hear me? Yes. Hi, Lamiko McGee. I live in Belchertown and I'm the Dean of Students at the Middle School. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, mine is not going to be long. Um, we're at a critical point in Amherst. Uh, I sit on DESE's Racial Imbalance Advisory Council, and we're able to look at demographic data from all over the state and determine whether schools are segregated or racially diverse. And guess what? Amherst Regional Schools are racially diverse. We are a school system with nearly a 50% balance of white and non-white students. And our students, whether white or non-white, are also tremendously diverse. This diversity is why I love working in our school district. I'm proud to work here, even in the midst of the storm. Although I think being racially diverse is a strength, we're probably at this point because white families are sending their children to schools elsewhere. All of this diversity creates constant tension. Time will tell how we manage conflicts. Will the school system decline as is in the case with many communities, white flight, and the defunding of schools, or will we move forward together? Which direction will we take in this extremely liberal town? The first step is funding our schools. Give us the resources to do right by our students this year. And then, yes, take the school committee and superintendent to task in managing the community's tax dollars efficiently. We need three-year and five-year plans that line up with our strategic goals and are fiscally responsible. We have a new school committee who have demonstrated to me that they are dedicated to the best possible outcomes for our students. I'm certain they will work lockstep with our new superintendent to root out inefficiencies in the budget, develop community partnerships to build excellent educational programming and seek out grant opportunities. I'm sure the regional school committee will use whatever means necessary to maintain the quality of our schools. But today, my friends, they need your help. Cutting the budget at this time of transition and regional leadership will be disastrous. And thank you for listening. Thank you for your comment. Thank you very um, much. And I apologize for throwing you out without bringing in. Thanks very much. No <laughs> um, uh, Mr. Connor, did you keep your hand uh, up? Now I, I see one more, um, it, Vince's hand is still up, but I'll, okay. I see one more hand went up that hadn't done Tony, it. Tony Cunningham, yes, please bring Tony in. Thank you, Tony, please uh, state your name and where you live. Thank you, Tony Cunningham, District 1. Um, so I wasn't planning on talking, but I, I want to echo and, and 
plus one to what Maria Kopicki said about the library. Uh, it's, it's kind of shocking that there hasn't been a building committee meeting in over three months and none of the financial implications have been discussed about many of the things that Maria described. And also plus one to what Vince O'Connor said about the schools. Um, I agree, it is a highly competitive market. I have a child in the middle school right now and another one in elementary in the public schools. And I mean, I, these cuts do make me look elsewhere. Uh, the language one in particular is, is going to really be devastating to the middle school program. And I, I really think the cut that was made a few years ago was devastating, making seventh grade only one semester of language. So the seventh graders really don't make much progress now. And if the same thing happens to the eighth grade, they're going to be starting with level one in ninth grade, meaning they're starting at the beginning. So anything the town can do to find funding to prevent these most harmful of cuts would be much appreciated. Um, as I mentioned at a town council meeting recently, many of the increases are beyond the control of the regional school committee. Uh, they don't control the chapter 70 increase being 0.78%. They don't control health insurance going up by 9.74%. And so making the students suffer as a result of some of these increases is really not fair. And I know the town is struggling too, but there was a decision made to give 10 and a half percent of property tax levies to the capital budget. I think that decision needs to be reversed and, and scale that back so that we can retain uh, the schools at the level that we expect. Thank you so much. Thank you for your comment. I think that's everyone. Is that correct, Kathy? I don't see anyone. I think I, that's still Vince's hand that didn't go down. So he's already spoken. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. I think we'll close public comment now. Um, any other comments from the committee? Um, just, just a couple, Bob, you know, in terms of looking forward, we had a, a discussion, but not a resolution on, um, how we're going to handle the budget, you know, talking to departments and one suggestion that I think Lynn sent to you later was to get some advice from Paul that if we want, if we want to focus on some, but not all or, or clusters, um, so I've still got, uh, twice a week for all of May on my calendar, you know, from original. So it would be good to try to um, get to some clarity on the meeting schedule and who's coming in when. And uh, if we re can we repeat to Doug what Mandy asked for, and then I asked for again, it, I think getting more information rather than less when we're dealing with really big budget items, i.e. regional school or elementary school. Um, we've been getting less and less over the years compared to the very first year that I was on the council. And when I go back to pre-council, some of the documents that the finance committee produced for the town meeting had information in it that I don't think they had to go do research for. I think they got it during their meetings, um, particularly on schools. Um, I, you know, I won't, and, and if you know, the, the town manager's budget document has almost nothing on the school, you know, so if it doesn't come out of flow out of us, it's, it's absent. So that's an issue. Then, um, the comments that we heard today on the library, I've been hearing them a lot from residents on what's happening. So it may not be finance, um, but just on, a a, a scheduling it may be feeding this back up to the council to to get a report on it um because it's the, the the contingency plan and the flow of money on the library was based on a certain schedule um so i i, I know for a fact because of jcpc that the major bond has not gone out yet because the congest until the cons the bids come in we don't know whether we ha they're even going to come in at at the at the limit. So, so just, I don't think that's necessarily finance committee, but feed that information up to the council president um, to figure out where in or otherwise packed. So I think that's my main, just trying to get a better handle. I mean, the, the meetings are already booked on my calendar, but just getting a sense of, of how many and how we're going to focus would be great. 
Yeah, I, I, I actually talked to Athena a little bit about this and we, um, I, I am going to try to map out, you know, kind of what we had talked about and see how, how it works. And then we can try to figure what, what, where we want to focus in on, on, in detail on the budget. So, and I'm right next week, we just had the, re it's not a just, but the regional school hearing, but, mm -hmm. um, but, um, if you send us something tentative and ask the comments just to come back to you, Paul's back next week. So, you know, we can, we can maybe firm this up a little bit more. Yeah. Uh, okay. Anybody else? Uh, then I need a motion to adjourn. <laughs> I make a motion to, I move to adjourn. I second. Okay. Um, let's just go around. Just Andy. Yes. Mommy, yes. Kathy? Yes. Cancel okay, so Haneke? Aye. It's unanimous. We're adjourned at 5.54 p.m. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone.